So, I wasn't expecting to be introduced as the birthday boy. Um, amongst my many credentials, that's uh, not the one I was expecting Chris to lead with. Uh, thank you, we'll get, we'll get to it, I promise. Um, this is Cleaning House with Aspect Rails 4. Uh, let's get started. To introduce myself, my name is Sam Fippin. I'm at Sam Fippin, basically everywhere on the internet. Uh, this profile picture was taken on a very fancy camera before I removed my beard. Um, I'm an Aspect Lead Maintainer, as Chris said, and I work at Google as a developer advocate for the Google Ads team. It's my birthday, uh, I'm 28. And the day has been a little bit of a reflective day for me. Uh, I spoke to my parents earlier, and my mom was like, of course you're at a computer conference, we always knew you were going to be a computer programmer. And I was like, so mom, how did you know that? This is me, <laughs> age one, <laughs> on an IBM PC portable. Uh, yeah, I just dug that out. So when I was writing this talk, I was thinking, well, there are many different ways that you can give a talk at a conference. And this sort of like speaking and slide structure is one that's been fairly well done at this point. So I did what anyone reasonable would do. I went to Twitter. I threw up a Twitter poll. I said, would you listen to an unstructured rant where I just talk about RSpec uh, for 40 minutes with no planning? 59% said yes, 41% said no. So I did what any reasonable human would do. I computed the p-value to determine whether or not that result is actually significant. It is not, so Chris, don't worry. We have a structured talk exactly as I submitted to the CFP, and I'm not just gonna yell at you for 40 minutes. <laughs> so I wanna talk about the word compatibility. When you hear the word compatibility, what does it bring to mind? Maybe whether the libraries in your application are going to mesh together well. Maybe when you upgrade something, is it going to continue to work? Is your test suite functional? Is your application functional? And most of our applications are not just code we write. We build them on the shoulders of giants. We're here at RailsConf. I would be willing to bet that for most of you, Rails has more code in it than you have written in your application. So it's the end of the conference, and I'm sure everyone's feeling a little bit low energy. So could everyone put their hands up, please? We're going to do poll time. Okay, I want you to put your hands down if your app, no. <laughs> if you have no test suite in your application whatsoever. Put your hands down if you have a test suite but you're not super happy with it, it's flaky, it breaks all the time. Well, the GitHub employees at the front just put their uh, hands down so we should all feel really great about that. Um, <laughs> Who has a really great test suite? Keep your hands up only if you have a really great test suite. If it's green, you would push to production with no fear whatsoever. That's plenty of you. I'm very impressed. Good job, Ruby. <laughs> the GitHub hands went back up. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually surprisingly impressive. The Ruby community, after all, is a community of testing. So you can all put your hands down now. There are a few of us here who have a lot of strong confidence in the test suites of our application. But what if I did this to your app? What if I came in, deleted your gemfile.lock, ran bundle update, committed, pushed, and immediately deployed to production? Face screaming in fear emoji. You're gonna get the newest versions of every dependency that your application has with no bounds or constraints whatsoever. You better be sure that your gem file is pinning everything exactly as you want. And if you're not, stuff is gonna blow up. So let's come back to compatibility. When we write a gem file, when we pull dependencies into our application, we say which versions we want. And then when we do a bundle install, it locks them. But if we delete that lock file, bundle is free to pull anything in it wants. If you have a pin like this, where you have something that's really important to your application and you don't specify a version, running a bundle install with no lock file is just gonna pull the latest version in. And if it's something that's critical to your application's functionality, that could well break it. If it's a new major or if there's been significant change in how it works, suddenly your application might stop working. And the converse is true as well, right? If we have pins that are too specific and we try to upgrade something else, we might fail to bundle and suddenly our application is forced to be several uh, versions behind the current latest versions of all the applications that we're working on. 
This idea of sort of overly and underly specific pins in our dependencies can sort of cause constraints and technical debt within our applications. And it's really important when you're building your gem file that you actually make sure that you're being diligent and careful about what kind of pins you're specifying. Now, in the Ruby community, we're very lucky that we have basically completely standardized on semantic versioning, which gives us a mechanism for talking about how we version our libraries. Semantic versioning specifies a major version, a minor version, and a patch level, and it tells us how to write them down, right? We write three digits, X here would be our major, Y would be our minor, and Z would be our patch level. This is what it means when you see installing Nokagiri 1.10.3 with native extensions, one would be our major, 10 would be our minor, and three would be our patch level. Semantic versioning also gives us a specification for how to like, change those numbers. It tells us when we're supposed to increment each of the positions, right? And so if you've fixed a bug, semantic versioning calls for incrementing of the patch level. If you've implemented or released a new feature, changed an API surface, done something that's backwards compatible but introduces new behavior, you increment the minor version. This can also be done for enhancements or performance fixes, that sort of thing. And then the major is for when you break something, right? But what does it mean to break something? Like, it's not releasing bugs. I hope none of you are versioning intentionally releasing bugs. But rather, like, changing the API surface in a way where you may or may not have incompatibility with whatever you're working on. Rails, by the way, explicitly is not using semantic versioning exactly. They have their own sort of, like, versioning scheme that you can go look up if you're interested in how it works. But for pretty much everything else in the Ruby community, we use semantic versioning uh, to decide uh, when we change the version numbers in our applications. And so the thing that seems to me to be most important here is this idea of breaking. Like, what is a breaking change? And you might think that the semantic versioning specification would, like, tell us, and then we could just rely on the spec, increment the numbers when it works, but no such luck. The, nowhere in the text of the semantic versioning spec does it define breaking change. And this is intentional, right? The semantic versioning spec is designed for libraries in all ecosystems, not just Ruby. And it would be really difficult for them to come up with a definition that works in C and Java and JavaScript and Ruby, so they just don't bother. At the beginning of the conference, David showed us the full text of the MIT license. And he focused specifically on a different paragraph to this one. He focused on the responsibilities that sort of users have. This paragraph is the responsibilities that maintainers have. The software is provided as is, without warranty of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability, fitness for a particular purpose, and there's another clause that got cut off here. This is pretty bleak, right? What this is basically saying is that a maintainer of an open source package can just break you at any time for any reason. And I'm not complaining here, this is like, a fair trade for the fact that all of this software is free and you can install it into your applications however and whenever you want. But this combines with semantic versioning to give us the sort of contracts that our libraries give to us. We use semantic versioning to sort of hedge around this particular thing. And so I wanna talk a little bit more deeply about how breaking changes work. And to do so, I'd like to consider this function. Let's imagine we have a function called status message that does some computation, it doesn't really matter, and then it returns the number one, two, three. Well, if I change the return signature of this function to return the string one, two, three, is this a breaking change? Well, the types have changed, so there are certainly some situations in which invoking this function will no longer have the same behavior. But what if I told you that the author of the library had intended for this function to only be used in template rendering? If you're using template rendering, you're probably just going to immediately string interpolate the value anyway. And if you're string interpolating the value, it doesn't matter if you change an integer to a string, right? Like, that is a perfectly safe behavior change to make. So let's look at another function, count rows. Here, count rows does some hard work, computation, and returns the integer one, two, three. What if I change it to a string now? Is this a breaking change? Well, this function has the word count in its name, and so I would probably argue that changing a function that has something to do with counting from returning an integer to a string is a wildly unexpected behavior. But let's just pause for a second. Those two functions 
were completely identical apart from their names, right? All I did was change the name from status message to count rows, and all of the semantic changes were equivalent. In one case, we said it was a breaking change, and in one case, we argued it wasn't. The point is that, like, objects in Ruby can be used in several different operations, right? We have 2S, identity, math, all kinds of functions live on all kinds of objects. And so without knowing what context an object is going to be used in, it's hard to reason about whether or not a breaking change is going to be made when you change something about how the system works. Another way of saying this is that breaking changes actually can't be defined by a purely source code basis. There's no mechanical process that you can go through to analyze arbitrary changes in source code and determine whether or not they're a breaking change. There are some communities like the Elixir community that have tools like AutoSemver that actually do this, where basically any time a type signature on a function changes, they force bump the major version. But to me, that doesn't seem like a good fit for Ruby libraries because we make these kinds of changes all the time and we communicate in context about whether or not those changes are safe. So let's come back to compatibility. We've talked about semantic versioning at an abstract. We've looked at some code and seen how it changes. And we're beginning to get this idea that like, compatibility comes not just from the code that we work on, but also context. In other words, compatibility isn't a technocratic thing. Like all good computer problems, there's actually a hard people problem underneath. And it's the hard people problem of deciding whether or not to communicate intent. And so I would like to argue that when you write down a version number, what's actually happening is that you as the author of a library are declaring something about what you intend the users of your library to receive when you uh, install that version. Another way of writing this is that semantic versioning is a mechanism for communicating intent. It's not a technocratic process that you have to go through when you change and version your libraries. It's a way of you, the author of a library, thinking about and considering what the impacts of your changes are going to be and then coding it into a system that can be understood by computers. Semantic versions are lexicographically sortable, which is a fancy way of saying bigger versions uh, come uh, last in sort of sort ordering. And what that means is that you as the author increment them exactly with intent to decide whether or not you've broken what your users are doing. And so, that's the sort of philosophical high level what even is Semver. Now I kind of want to talk about how it applies to RSpec. So for the longest time, the semantic versioning guarantee of RSpec has been that between a major, we will never break your tests. And like, that would be a fairly bad thing for a testing framework to do if you upgraded a minor version and suddenly all of your tests were broken. That wouldn't be so great. And so in your gem file, if you have a pin to RSpec 3.0, what we're saying to you is that we, the maintainers of RSpec, will not under any circumstances break your tests as long as you're not changing any of the other stuff out from underneath us. And that's, that's a versioning strategy, right? That tells us what we need to do in order to correctly version RSpec, and it tells you what you need to do to make sure that your tests aren't going to break when you update your RSpec versions. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about how RSpec is structured and how this is gonna change. So this is the basic dependency diagram of RSpec. When you say gem RSpec, you're not actually getting any code within the RSpec gem itself. RSpec is made up of a series of other gems that function as independent libraries. So when you say gem RSpec, it depends on RSpec core, RSpec mocks, and RSpec expectations. And those are entirely independent libraries that just happen to work well together to, uh, to create the entire RSpec testing framework. For example, if you're writing a test suite in Minitest and you're struggling to get a mock or stub in quite the right place, you can pull in RSpec mocks as an alternative mocking library, integrate it with Minitest, uh, and all of your like, mocking capabilities will suddenly use RSpec instead of Minitest. But this isn't just true of that library, it's also tr true for RSpec core, which is a library for structuring and executing your tests, and RSpec expectations, which is how you build uh, complex and compound uh, arbitrary value matches. So the dependency diagram for RSpec looks like this, but we also have RSpec Rails. And RSpec Rails is a separate library that you install if you want to test your Rails apps. I suspect those of you who are RSpec users in the room have this in your gem file, right? And RSpec Rails 
is different. It actually contains a whole bunch of Rails-specific code that enables us to like link up against Rails' various testing frameworks in order to let you test things like requests, execute system tests, test your models, and so on. And RSpec Rails also depends on RSpec, and through its dependency on RSpec, it gets RSpec Core, RSpec Mocks, and RSpec Expectations. And so with that understanding of our dependency, if you go to RubyGems, what you'll see is that RSpec Core, RSpec Mocks, oh, sorry, RSpec Expectations, RSpec Mocks, and RSpec Rails are all currently versioned at 3.8 point some patch level. And this is intentional. When we release the RSpec libraries today, we release them in lockstep version. Even if there's no enhancements or fixes in one of the libraries, we release them all together so that they interdepend and get the latest version of everything from each other. You combine this with the fact that there hasn't been a need for an RSpec major in nearly four years, and you get to where we've just gone from 3 to 3.1 to 3.2 and so on, all the way through the 3.8 series. Um, the RSpec APIs are fairly stable. We haven't seen much in the way since we did our last breaking change release where we felt the need to remove uh, APIs that could potentially break people's tests. But I've been thinking about this a little bit recently because I showed you the dependency diagram of RSpec and RSpec Rails, and the thing is, this section right here is really the problem. Since we released RSpec 3, the entire Rails 5 series and now Rails 6 is around the corner, they've been released. The rest of the RSpec libraries have no third-party dependencies. They don't have anything external that they need to depend on. But, well, Rails is a moving target. They release really quickly, and that's great for all of us in the room. This is a picture of the current versions of Rails as they stand today. 5.2 receives bug fixes and security patches. 5.1, 5.0, and 4.2 all still receive security patches, and Rails 6 will release soon. But at the time when RSpec 3 was released, we also supported 4.1 and 4.0, and 3.2, 3.1, and 3.0. And because we haven't released an RSpec major since we did that, uh, we still support Rails is all the way back to 3.0, and Ruby's all the way down to 1.8.7. That's a lot of Ruby versions and Rails versions to support. And you may be asking yourself, Sam, why on earth are you doing this? It's a reasonable question. Well, as I said, we haven't had a reason other than this to drop a new RSpec major in the last four years. And it's not like those libraries are sort of directly actually coupled. And so I decided that the thing we actually needed to do is change our versioning strategy. And so I sort of began noodling on what this would look like, and I started to build consensus within the team. Uh, I'm not the only RSpec lead maintainer. There are two of us. It's making lead a very weird title. And then there are a whole host of other RSpec core team members, right? I wasn't just going to do this unilaterally. I needed to actually talk to people and make sure this was a good idea. So I wrote this RFC, RSpec Rails needs a new versioning strategy. And this outlined my proposal, what we were going to do. But the primary point was this. We need a change of representation of what we use Semver for in RSpec Rails. And this is a totally reasonable thing to do. I think more libraries should have an explicit description of what they're going to use semantic versioning for in how they work. And so I proceeded to outline a strategy, and it has four points. The first one is very broad. It says RSpec Rails will now be versioned separately to the rest of RSpec. Basically, RSpec Rails is current hamstrung today by the fact that it has to stay in lockstep major with the other versions of RSpec, which don't need to release majors all that quickly. Then I proceeded to define what a major version actually is. Release a major with any new Rails major, remove support for unsupported Rails versions, and add support for the new major. This gives us our crystal clear definition of when we're going to break things. Every time Rails releases a new major, we're going to break the versions of Rails that are now unsupported. We release miners with Rails miners and otherwise uh, new RSpec features and patch levels. Basically, you should always just release patch levels as quickly as you can because they have bug fixes and bug fixes are extremely low cost. I think every library should have a clear and stable definition of what a breaking change is so that you know whether or not you're actually breaking someone when you use it. 
I'm working on a second library at the moment that I think is really interesting called Ruby Format right now. And one of the very first things I did when I wrote the issue template is I defined what a breaking change was. I was like, you know what? If we're gonna build this, let's just make sure users have a good understanding of when we're going to break their stuff. And so we implemented this new versioning strategy and I just kind of wanna walk through quickly the sort of branching and development strategy. This is now fairly in the weeds of how RSpec is actually developed. Uh, so we cut uh, a major version branch and this started, by the way, at the beginning of this year. I actually started working on this on the 19th of January, which was just before I joined Google. The fun thing about having like a long running development branch is you can do a lot of work that might not be safe to do on your master. So the first thing I did is delete every Rails version that we weren't going to support. And this is a nice blood red diff. I love it when you can just delete code, it's great. Then you wait and you wait and you wait for the Rails core team to actually release uh, the release candidate of Rails 6, which happened like a week and a half ago. So I had to do a frans uh, frantic piece of development work to get uh, everything ready for this talk so I could actually talk about the new aspect version that I'm talking about in this talk, if that makes any sense. So then you add that Rails version to your Travis matrix and fix like just so many bugs, just so many bugs. And today, we have uh, a beta of Aspect Rails 4 that you can pull down from Ruby Gems. I will note, by the way, this says beta 2. Uh, that is because I released beta 1, it was broken, uh, and I immediately had to yank it. Uh, the beta was up there, I think, for 15 total minutes before I realized that it didn't work. Uh, good job. So that's kind of the development story, the Semver story. Uh, now it's time for me to dramatically read the Aspect changelog at you as I do every year at RailsConf. Um, so we're dropping all of these Railses and all of these Rubies. You can't read it because there were so many out of Travis Matrix that I had to minimize my browser all the way down. Um, this is Rails's 3.0 and up and uh, Ruby's 187 and up. Uh, now our Travis Matrix looks like this and you might actually be able to read it if you're close to the front. Um, so. Ruby's below 2.3 are no longer supported and Rails below 5.0 is no longer supported. These are the currently supported versions of uh, Ruby and Rails. But there is an asterisk here. Um, RSpec has supported uh, Rails 4.2 for the longest time and I didn't want to do a sudden knee-jerk breakage. So Rails 4.2 will be CI'd against in the final build of uh, RSpec Rails 4.0.0 and after that, we will remove it from the CI matrix. So you get like one last version, but after that, no. The other caveat to this, by the way, is that there were literally zero changes in the actual production code of the gem. It was all build stuff. And so theoretically, you can still use RSpec Rails with Rails 3, but please stop using Rails 3. It's really dead at this point. Um, and then going forward, uh, current and previous Rails majors will be supported. So when Rails 6 comes out, uh, 6 and 5 will be supported. When 7 comes out, at some point in the future, uh, 7 and 6, and so on. Um, David showed us this in the opening keynote. Uh, we are not supporting J2EE, but for the first time in many years, I'm actually really happy to be able to announce uh, RSpec now supports JRuby. Uh, JRuby was... <laughs> Thank you. Um, JRuby has been unsupported by RSpec for the last four years. Uh, I was able to meet up with Charles Notter and Tom uh, Enabo at Ruby Kaigi and sit down with them and get it working. Uh, so we now CI against JRuby. I'm really pleased about this because JRuby is kind of a big deal. Um, and we're off version with the rest of RSpec. RSpec Rails will now be versioned in line with Rails instead of in line with RSpec. This makes much more sense. Uh, for RSpec as a library. But this leaves a question, what happens with the next RSpec major? So I talked to the core team about this and like, we don't know if we're ever going to make like mainline RSpec 4. Like, I, we don't get that many complaints that would requ require breaking changes for us to release that. So if RSpec 4 ever happens, RSpec Rails will support it, uh, but I don't know if that's gonna happen. Um, so that's all that I got. But uh, there's one sort of last thing. Uh, we really need your help. Uh, RSpec Rails uh, has not received as much attention as it needs, and I can't on my own and with the rest of the maintainers give it 
uh, everything we need. Really, we haven't implemented support for a new Rails feature uh, in a couple years, basically since system test, and I could really just do with someone to come along and help me with that. We really need attention on these things. Bug fixes are piling up, and it's not great. So if you can look at the RSpec issue tracker, pluck off a bug, triage it, or even fix it, I would be super grateful. If you're interested in actually like doing some full-time work on RSpec, please, or not full-time, but like continuous work on RSpec, uh, please come up to me afterwards and let's have a chat. We really, really need some help. Um, that's all I got. Thank you so much. I'm at Sam Fippin. That's my email address. Uh, cheers.